Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, alive, it's alive, it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. Welcome back, everyone, to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute, a podcast that celebrates the films of Gene Wilder one minute at a time. In season two, we are diving into the film Blazing Saddles, and we are here for minute number eight, where we are looking at minute number eight, one $400 hand car minute at a time. I'm your host. I'm Alan Sanders. I'm your co-host, Walt Murray. And joining us again from good old california usa we've got professor robert black welcome back <laughs> thank you love it love being able to say we have a professor it just classes up the joint oh yeah you know now on the flip side you know being raised the way i am and having the wife the way i do we you know, we knew we had a professor coming over i had to like clean and dust i had to make sure everything <laughs> was put up i wasn't able to get any beer out you know i had to just we had to be very polite and sit you know back straight and everything you couldn't get beer out for the professor? Oh, no. We have to have champagne or something. <laughs> <laughs> I know better. <laughs> it just makes me feel like we have to class the joint up a little bit. Yeah. All right. So for minute number eight, you, you joined us yesterday. Hopefully you saw that our main, our main hero, Bart, and his friend Charlie were stuck in quicksand. And so we're going to continue this minute where Bart and Charlie are... They hear Lyle or they hear Taggart say, Lyle, get your rope down over there. And then Bart and Charlie, by the end of this minute, are able to start to drag themselves out. But we do hear a little bit about of a, about the plan that's actually going to be what triggers the rest of the plot of this film. And that is going to be shifting the railroad tracks away from the quicksand and just a little off the side of the hill through a canyon. And unfortunately, toward the town of Rock Ridge. That is correct. <laughs> mm-hmm. Thanks, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow with another minute. <laughs> we can confirm that. <laughs> no, you, you, you can't get analysis like this just anywhere. <laughs> Sorry, I was distracted. Uh, uh, I know you'll be surprised by that. You? You're distracted? Yes, I know. I, I got down a rabbit hole <laughs> <laughs> trying to read articles about uh, cattle roping. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, my first question. It's called research, people. Okay. Yeah, you're supposed to do that ahead of time. Wait, what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, look, you're not the professor here, okay? <laughs> yeah. Robert's getting flashbacks of students, like, <laughs> racing into class at the last second, still filling out the paper. <laughs> just, 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 just one uh, more yeah, second. Just, just, just one I'm more second. Collecting. Yeah, I'm, I've been that guy. I gotta ask that, Robert. Do you do you run into students who try to figure out how to creatively procrastinate with you with with assignments? Yes, constantly. I, I'm nice about a lot of it. Like I usually collect papers at the end of class because I know people don't keep up and they'll handwrite something, but at least they turned in something. But people come up with excuses a lot. Do you have kind of at the off the top of your head one of the more creative excuses why somebody, you know, the the old one when we grew up was the dog ate the homework, but what's been some of the more creative ones? Oh no, the the good one in college is the and this might actually be true often because you know, I live in LA and it's a lot of like Hispanic population where they care about their extended family. A lot of people take care of their sick grandparents conveniently when a paper's due. <laughs> Grandma got herself a case of the uh, of the squirts, and we yeah. just were up with her all night long. <laughs> yeah, it, it was sad how many of my family members got deathly ill during my years of college. <laughs> I, I yeah. nearly lost an entire wing of the family tree. <laughs> <laughs> like how many grandparents do you hey, don't have judge me. like five funerals <laughs> well don't, don't you judge me <laughs> yeah, it's the modern family i have 12 grandparents well between all the divorces and remarries and and shacking up i mean <laughs> exactly 
Who's, why, who am I to judge? Yeah. I got to tell you this, Robert, you'll get a kick out of this one. Uh, and by the time this airs, my daughter should be pretty much on her way to her last couple of classes to graduation. She overwhelmed herself one semester early on at UGA. And she had a paper that was due and she realized there is no way at all this paper is being transmitted at midnight in any way of a complete form. So she took a Word mm-hmm. doc. Now, I... I feel bad that I'm doing this, but hey, you know, she was planning to write it. Let me just tell you the whole story. So she labeled her paper, saved the file, and it saves it as a word dot doc, right? Actually, I take that back. She opened a graphic file, made like a a, a word, or excuse me, a, a, a Photoshop image that was normally saved as a JPEG. She renamed it and yeah. put it as a dot doc and then emailed that to her professor. <laughs> well, the professor turned around and said, <laughs> I had, tr- well, actually, I take that back. I got to tell the whole story. She assumed this would buy her a day, that the professor would get it sometime the next morning, have trouble opening it, tell her the file was corrupt or something, and tell her, you know, can you get that to me when you get back to your whatever, and that she would have the day to finish the paper. So she was legitimately going to finish the paper. The weirdest thing happened. No email. No phone call, and she got a 90 on her paper. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) So, apparently, the professor must have thought, oh, what did I do? I totally hosed this kid's assignment. The teacher didn't want the hassle. I can't legitimately give her a 100, but I can't give her less than an A, so he gave her a 90, and she was just... Now, she didn't try it again, but she's just like, holy crap, that worked. This isn't my show, so none of my students should be listening. But if I lose someone's speech, like the grade sheet, and I haven't written down the grade yet, I usually give them 100. Really? Yeah. It's easier than trying to ask them to give it back to me or something, like if I gave it back, but I forgot to write it down. Yeah, I guess I never thought of it from the professor's perspective. Do you want to look incompetent to your student? Do you want to look like you you couldn't handle opening an email attachment and, and reading? So... I guess to sort of like the worst that happens is they pass. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. And then you send them out, to, out into the world to work for us. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Oh, they'll fill another class. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. To, to, to kind of bring it back around though, I imagine you also as a professor, especially if it's midway through or toward the end of a semester, you have a sense of who are the brighter kids and the ones that have done their work. And chances are, if you're the good kid and you pull that, you've got a better chance of getting away with it than the kid who's been the slacker since day one. Definitely, Because I know they're, I know like within a week, like the, when the first assignment is due, I know who's actually trying to do everything on time. Cause they've already talked to me. They've asked questions. So Yeah, by the end, if you're the person who has barely kept up with any assignments, I had a student who hadn't done any of his speeches, because I teach speech class, and right before the last speech, he's like, can I still make up the other ones? I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? I knew there was no chance he was actually going to manage that in a week. But if he showed (laughs) up with speeches ready, cool. (laughs) You've realized somebody's really good under pressure. (laughs) It's like wow. life. All right. Now well, let's get to this Senator... minute number. Oh. Oh. No, stop. <laughs> yeah. And he's running for yeah, governor running for of the Congress. state. Um... <laughs> well, let's get back to minute oh, number eight. We're talking I, have, about a movie. I have a question right off the bat. <laughs> yeah, we are we're talking about blazing saddles. Our hero is drowning in quicksand he is on not a hand drowning. car. And we covered this last minute. No, not technically. (laughs) I know, but hey, I'm trying to be dramatic for the audience. It's Hollywood. In Hollywood terms, they were going to drown. You do realize that underneath the surface and disappear, never to be seen again. We're going to see Charlie decide. It looks like oatmeal. I guess Tim is going to try a little bite. But (laughs) before we get to that, see, I was really hoping for the old cartoon quicksand trick where they're submerged, but their finger, their hand comes up, and they go one two and then as they're about to do three Uh somebody pulls them out (laughs) a la bugs bunny yes when you hear taggart yell loud get your rope over here 
I'm immediately thinking, okay, they're going to go rescue these two people. Why does Charlie get off of what is the only solid, tangible thing, the hand car? Because the actor playing him knew he needed to get out of the way. (laughs) (laughs) Because Mel Brooks is on the other side of the screen here saying, okay, Charlie, I need you to move away for them to be able to get the rope around the handle. I've never understood yeah, if that. If he ropes that now, he might catch you, and that's <laughs> we don't, not good. We don't want to snag you with the rope. That's not the message we're saying. We need you to get out of the way so we can hook the hand car. But I don't. I, I mean, I don't get it. And in, in just in terms of story, he's on a solid object. That object hasn't moved anymore. And all of a sudden, as he rolls off and then d- gets behind or next to Bart, all of a sudden he goes a lot deeper in the quicksand. And it's always bugged me. Why did you get off the hand car? Well, and if he can move that easily, why doesn't he just move to the edge? Hey, he's closer to the where they went in to begin with. Why go deeper? <laughs> yeah, just swim out. I, I chalk it up to panic because when you're in a panic situation, you don't make good decisions. Oh, is that what it is? Charlie's panicking? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what it is. <laughs> Uh, Well, I mean, the poor guy doesn't even have a hat, so he's had the sun beating down on his head all day. Now he's trapped trapped in quicksand. He's almost had a confrontation, a physical confrontation with his boss and the the other hired hands. He's had a rough day. (laughs) So now this, and yeah, he's just not making good decisions. When Lyle does loop the hand car, Cleavon Little's expression of going from Joy of being rescued to just sheer incred- incredulity at the hand car being saved is just a wonderful shot. Charlie's kind of just looking off nowhere, but Bart is selling what he's feeling. Well, even Charlie has a little bit of a look of what what am I watching here? What the heck's going on? But he's looking more like toward Lyle. Bart turns his head to the hand car yeah. and then watches as it moves out of frame. Yeah, very true. I mean, again, they just, it's a comedy. Yeah, and then they kind of look That's at each funny. other. And yeah, it, it is. And it, it fits so well with this movie because, you know, it, it is good comedy, but it also pisses you off because you realize that they value the hand car so much more than these these two human beings. Yeah. What what kind of statement is that? I mean, it's both funny and just shocking because. Taggart feels like that would have been the worst thing to report back to his bosses, that they darn near lost a $400 hand car. Wow! Get your rope down! Get over there, quick! Right, Mr. Taggart. Dang, that was lucky. Doggone near lost a $400 hand car. Yeah, but apparently losing two of the the hired guys, that doesn't matter at all. No, they'll just dock them a day's pay and move along. Yeah, how much do they cost? Yeah, how much do they cost? Uh, Right. Yeah, so these are just employees. Oh, no, they're not slaves. This is later, so. Well, they're employees, but, I mean, were they treated much better? (laughs) No. In fact, I think we even talked about that with Jim O'Kane, that even though a lot of the freed black slaves from from the South that went to go work on the railroad wrote extensively in the, and the ballad of John Henry is about how life along the railroad wasn't all that much better. Well, and I think that was kind of universal too. I think that was, um, you know, the uh, black employees, Chinese employees and Irish, all of them were just kind of treated as, uh, worse than a piece of equipment. Yeah. They were, what do you call it when they were, they were like collateral losses of what it would cost to put the railroad in. Yeah, completely expendable. It's interesting because here we are. We're not even eight total minutes. Like This is the eighth minute. We're halfway through this. So a little over seven minutes and you realize two and a half minutes are credits. And one of the minutes is almost just a pan into where these folks are working. How quickly we continue to reinforce the way one side of this race equation is treated and how the other side treats them. You know, it's it immediately continues to reinforce that Taggart could not care less about anybody that doesn't look like him. Yeah, no, he really doesn't. And, you know, one thing I was just looking at here that goes along with that is when he, uh, when Charlie does come off of the cart, it's right as Lyle is 
um, is spinning the rope and ready to throw it. So he may well have thought that Lyle was going to throw the rope to him so he didn't even need to be on the card anymore. Oh, it could be. Turn around and see it coming. Yeah, and so he knew that he was about to be rescued, and instead he lassoes the cart and pulls it out. And he wants to be looking when that rope comes. Right right after Slim Pickens makes that comment, and he just, it's like to himself, like, oh, whew, that was darn near lost a $400 hand car. He immediately starts looking where, where are we going to have to now fix the track? He yeah. doesn't even care to look back at these two guys. Yeah, these guys are done. They're already dead. They're in quicksand. It doesn't matter. Yeah. He's on to business. I think you already have this coming, but that's something different in the script, too, where he's already getting to his map before they're even thinking they're going to get out. They're yelling for help, and he's just, like, telling them to be quiet. Does he say, would you folks hold it down just a minute? <laughs> We're trying to get some work done here. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The The script has things done in a little bit of a different order, and there's actually cont- more dialogue, as you said. They yell, help, help. Tagger comes and says, after getting the, reading a map, now let's see here, we can't go straight ahead and we can't swing right because of this ravine. We're going to have to turn north. And then to Rock Ridge, which we don't hear in this minute at all. Would you, and then you hear Bart and Charlie apparently are yelling, would you folks hold it down just a minute? We're trying to get some work done here. We can't hear ourselves thinking with all that help, help, help going on. Now let's see. And then Bart and Charlie are yelling, help, help, softer. <laughs> then they say, Two human beings dying here. Yeah, two brothers heading for the basement. Yeah, two brothers heading for the basement. Then Charlie, yeah, I'm reading the stuff that was initially in the script. Yeah. All before lassoing the hand car, Taggart then, holy cow, hurry, Lyle, get a rope. So we get the get a rope. And then Taggart says, hey, Lyle, can you still do that fancy thing with the rope? And Lyle says, I don't know. I'll try. (laughs) <laughs> and then Lyle does some fancy rope act, jumps through the loop, and then does some other rope tricks. We get rid of all of that shenanigans. Bart and Charlie, are, Bart and Charlie are staring at each other in disbelief. Then Lyle says, "Hey, you want to see the hang the dog? Or you want to see hang dog tail?" And Tiger goes, "No, better hurry and get that rope in there." Bart and Charlie both heave a sigh of relief. Lyle then skillfully tosses the rope in their direction. Bart and Charlie stare in amazement as the rope sails over their heads, out of their reach. It loops around the handle of the hand car. Taggart and Lyle then, Lyle as Lyle's trying to pull the rope back of the, uh, off the wagons. Taggart says, "Hurry up! That's a four hundred dollars. That's four hundred dollars worth of hand car sinking there." Bart and Charlie, hand car. Hey, you stupid son of a bitch! What about us? <laughs> Taggart says, "Now that's the kind of attitude that holds you people back." Maybe if you had a little respect for your betters, you could make your way up in this world. Charlie, up? That's what we want. Up. Taggart, let me get back to you on that. Now, Lyle. (laughs) And that all doesn't exist in the movie. (laughs) Walt, since... (laughs) See, Robert's got the script. He does way too much research for a guest. He's making me look bad now. But Walt, I know you 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 leave the script (laughs) stuff up to me. Can you imagine how slow this scene would have been had we had a page and a half of all this extraneous stuff? I think I think the slowness would be funny, though. (laughs) Some of the dialogue isn't very good, but the slowness is kind of funny. He's doing rope tricks instead of doing anything. Yeah, but I was going to say that there are a couple things about that. Um you really have to be very, very, very skilled with the rope to be able to do rope tricks. You have to be really skilled to be able to get it around anything, you know, moving object or whatever. Um, but even just to hit a, a target with it is is pretty good. So that would have been an investment of another actor. And I don't know if that falls under stunts, but I don't know that Lyle, you know, he, he told us, Burton told us that he had done some, Uh, ranch work but uh, probably not enough to be that adept at it but he does have a pretty good um you know he he handles the rope pretty well right there at the beginning but i I think that would have been a long kind of drug out scene that we probably didn't need to make the point that they're trying to make and not this early in the movie yeah not this early in the movie yeah i'd agree with you um but i i think that it, it it would have added um probably not a whole lot or nothing to the story but it would have uh, drug it out a little bit longer. 
What's interesting is in the script, all the stuff I just read, what's missing are the lines we do get of Charlie looking over at Bart and saying, Bart, they're going to leave us here to die. And Char- and then Bart says, take it easy, Charlie. My foot's on the rail. None of that's in the script. That was either written on the fly or they kind of improv it to kind of keep things moving a little quicker. Well, that's also something I like in terms of character development for Bart in the script version. Lyle is throwing the rope over them and he just happens to grab the rope because it's going by and gets dragged out here. He is like, I'm still on the rail. I can climb and get myself out. And he drags Charlie. Mm -hmm. And so Bart's actually more proactive in the film. Yeah, this this particular take doing it the way we have on camera, the theatrical version, Bart stays calm. Bart stays clear thinking. And Mm -hmm. Bart actually continues to show how he's the hero of this movie. Yeah. That that is true. I'm going to insert crickets right there. <laughs> <laughs> no, insert like an audience applause. You mean the applause break there. Whistles and standing yeah. ovation. <laughs> we were so impressed. And we get the guys from speak. the old Guinness commercial. Brilliant! Brilliant! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm just watching a guy lasso a calf. <laughs> what are you? Are you turning into Jason from the Rocky Minute? <laughs> I don't know. These these guys that are uh, that are able to throw these ropes around these moving calves are pretty damn impressive. <laughs> what in the wide, wide world of sports are you doing? <laughs> I'll be back with you in a little while. <laughs> I heard you Here's get a little I... commentary going on our podcast, not to watch a bunch of Kansas. No. <laughs> well, well, here's some slow motion cowboy cattle roping. <laughs> it's only 30 minutes. I'll, I'll be right back. Be right back. <laughs> <laughs> so, Robert, uh, well, I know you, you just got the... a co-host, but maybe we need another host. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, all this reminds me of the guy on the Buffalo uh, series on the Internet. Have you all seen that? <laughs> No, it's a guy who lassos a buffalo and um, then takes the buffalo home with him and uh, he gives up his horse and rides the buffalo around from then on. And um, he ends up having to take vengeance on the guys who try to kill him. So uh, it's a this great a Western. Movie? Yeah, it's it's a movie. I'll okay. um, I'll post the uh, first in the series of the guy on the buffalo at some point. Um, but there's huh. some pretty impressive rope work in that. Huh? What? Well, it, it, it will apply when Mongo shows up, considering what he rides. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that'd be a good time to post that. Yeah, save that for when Mongo shows up. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I mentioned this a few minutes ago. Why? Because <laughs> Charlie, his head is nowhere close to going under. Why, why does he not only start to dip his <laughs> mouth into the quicksand, but then rubs like more quicksand on his face? Yeah, it looks like it's oatmeal. It does look like oatmeal. Maybe it is. Maybe it tastes good. Well, this is only, I think this is Charlie McGregor's first movie. I think. Um, and we've talked a little bit about his history. He, he was actually in prison before he, um, he became an actor. And I'm just guessing that he probably had not had a whole lot of formal uh, training as an actor. Well, it could be, but... <laughs> It's always funny because he purposely dips his chin and his mouth into the quicksand and then his hands all covered in stuff and he tries to wipe his mouth and it doesn't get any better. So he's like going trying to spit the quicksand out. (laughs) It's just it's it's it's, it's an impressive move. It's just what the hell are you doing? Well, I'm going to have to stand corrected on something I just said. Uh, Charlie McGregor was actually in The French Connection, uh, something called Born to Win, Comeback Charleston Blue, Superfly, which y'all may have seen, mm. um, and three other movies before he was in Blazing Saddles. So Charlie had no excuse at this point. He was kind of <laughs> an, an accomplished actor who had been in front of the camera a good bit. This is just bad acting. <laughs> I take back every bit of my earlier analysis. <laughs> it it almost feels like he forgot he's in a scene. He forgot he's in fake quicksand and he's like just having a good time in a pool. 
<laughs> just splashing around. And then when he got some in his mouth, he's like, oh, no, that's not water. Um, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I mean, it's both funny, but I'm like, oh, my, what the heck are you doing? Yeah. I actually almost see it like a little kid. Like, I imagine if it was a little kid who does that. I don't imagine an adult who loses track of where his mouth is in, in relation to the quicksand. Do you think that what he was trying to do was kind of do a fake slip and fall into the water? Or do you think he just kind of... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what he's doing there. I don't know. Because he's he's not sinking. And I don't know if, if, if Mel said, you know, try to duck down a little bit. Make it look like, you know, you're, you're, you're in in peril and Bart hasn't pulled you back up just yet. He's still trying to inch his way on the rail. <laughs> but it's just, just him constantly going poof, 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 and then you see his tongue before we cut to that. He's like trying to shove whatever mu- mud or whatever that is out of his mouth. And that's got to be gross, whatever it is. I mean, they're out in the hot sun, you know, that's just got to be tepid water. And... Now, now I'm doing live research. <laughs> I was trying to figure out what they use for quicksand. Cause I know in, um, Krull, but that's like several years after this, it was bits of uh, um, cork floating on the water. But it was enough of it that you couldn't see the sur- below the surface. And so, but if you got below the cork, you're fine. It's just water. But this doesn't look like that. It looks, it, I don't know. No, it almost looks like they've got some kind of a a combination of sawdust and, and some kind of a I don't know what it is that's keeping this stuff on the surface. It's obviously water. It, it looks like maybe like sawdust and maybe some ground up hay or straw or something. And because they wanted that consistency. Could be because there's definitely a lot of water in there because when they pull the hand car out, you can see clear water come rolling out of the handle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I imagine they probably would have had to have dug this little pit and lined it almost like a mini pool filled it up with water and then just put this surface layer stuff just thick enough that to create this sense of mud. Yeah, that would make sense. And it, and it does. I'm looking at their clothes as they're coming out and as they rise up, that stuff is really thick and it really clumps all over them. I think it's real mud on the edge of whatever that pool is, but it almost looks like sawdust or some kind of a mix of dust and, and powder. Because if you look when Bart's moving along the rail, Everything looks really thick and chunky like sawdust, but behind him, everything looks like almost powder or like they sprinkled sand on top of whatever is floating on the water. So whatever whatever they put on the surface to create sort of that dirt looking effect, um, th- there must be two layers, something that's floating, whether it's chopped up cork, whether it's wood chips or something. And then they've sprinkled actual sand on top to give it that texture. Yeah, and that could be... Um... Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm looking at it, too. I, I, I'm i guessing it's kind of maybe this whatever they used in all the Tarzan movies when people went in, because it looks like that same consistency where, um, yeah, you're not supposed to be able to move around in it at all and whatever. But everybody always seems to be able to. Well, while those guys are crawling their way out and Charlie's trying to sample this mixture, Taggart continues on his how we're going to reroute the railroad. I didn't know that Taggart, if they had surveyors that were out and about that told them, hey, there might be some quicksand up ahead. Is Taggart suddenly the new surveyor himself? Has he got the autonomy to just decide we're going to make the railroad go this way? Yes, he does. Um, I think he's like the the head guy. I mean, he must be. But I mean, there's no engineering. There's no people. He's like, we're going to have to send some people out. He's just like, you know what? I'm looking down and he does that whole squint thing as if like that's his like he. He doesn't even need a, a surveyor's glass or anything. He just says, yeah, we're just going to, I'm going to lean down and look to the right, look to the left. And if I look at my map, I think if we go right just <laughs> off to the hill over there and just right, right past the little uh, canyon, we ought to be, we ought to be okay. Like just he's, he's eyeballing it. I don't know that the railroad industry would have appreciated that, that approach. Well, he does have surveyors. He mentioned one before. They'll figure out the specifics. Well, that could be it. He's, he's the big picture guy. Yeah, that could be it. Maybe he's just like, okay, based on what I'm seeing, this is what we'll have to do. Now I'll go get some guys to go map it out for us. That's why we have you, Robert. You know, you think of these things. (laughs) You're you're the voice of sanity for us. So it shows you how bad a shape we're in. (laughs) (laughs) 
Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're only in minute eight and this thing's already going. Well, We're already sinking in quicksand. <laughs> We are, we're Bart and Charlie. Have you seen the, the show Hell on Wheels? No. Uh, the first season of it, yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's kind of an interesting drama. It's based on the building of the railroad. And um, the guys in that, I don't think they've got any real formal training. It, and this is supposed to be somewhat historically accurate. Uh, they're just guys who have been around railroad building enough to know how it works and uh, I guess they do have surveyors and, and, and folks like that, but these guys are just railroad guys uh, who become the foreman, and they do have a lot of autonomy in the decision-making. I just pulled my headphones out of my... <laughs> I got a dog scratching at my door, and he's pissing me off. All right, sorry. I had just made the most cogent I can't wait to hear what that sounds like. It, it, observation yeah, it was ever brilliant. made, and it's gone now. So. <laughs> sorry. So back to cattle roping. <laughs> do, do you need to go back to one? Yeah. Well, I was uh, just going to say, uh, you can piece all this together, but in Hell on Wheels, which is supposed to be somewhat historically accurate, the uh, the guys who are in charge do have a lot of autonomy, and they're just railroad guys who've worked the railroads for a long time and know where to build. So they do have surveyors and some other folks, but as far as like a, a formal engineer, uh, they might have had those guys for bridges. But I think for other stuff that they probably didn't have uh, too many folks that were really that educated and trained. It was just guys who knew how to build railroads. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I, obviously, it's not like by the standards we have today, but it's still, I mean... You got to keep that rail pretty straight and consistent all the way down. And it's just interesting to see Taggart, the way he's acting, he's sort of like hunched down and he'll, he leans to one side and then he leans to the other and he's squinting as if like somehow he's got it all figured out just by, by doing all those machinations. Yeah, we, we can take it right off to the, just a little bit to the left of that, that hill over yonder. I think we can assume that he's brilliant. <laughs> he certainly, oh, there we go. That's what it is. <laughs> He, it's just hiding under that yeah. gruff exterior. This is the movie showing us <laughs> that he's actually really good at this. That must be it. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Well, we have a scene coming up where he's actually explaining um, to an interested party mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. where they're taking everything. And uh, so he at least understands how it all works, where they need to go, and can map it all out. Oh, I got it. You you don't mean here. You mean tomorrow. Uh, he'll be explaining uh, to someone. In fact, we move into it in, in the next minute. Um, next minute? No. Yeah, tomorrow he, he will explain yeah. why the railroad's going where it's going. And Well, see, you cheated. I'm only watching this minute. I don't know what happens. Yeah, see, I am. Um, You've never seen this film. I, I'm only watching it one minute at a time. I, I peeked ahead. <laughs> you peeked ahead. Is that why you were watching all the rope tricks? Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, I heard there was a good scene coming up, so I wanted okay. to watch ahead a little bit. <laughs> yeah, why well, watch this scene when there's better ones later? Right. That's right. All right, well, we are actually going to end this minute eight, as you do see that both Bart and Charlie are at least crawling out of the muck. They don't seem to be in danger of sinking anymore, but for some reason they feel like they've got to continue to do this sort of army crawl rather than sort of stand up, and... I guess that's going to play into the next minute somehow. So we'll have to just leave it right where we are. And before I tease what's coming up tomorrow, Robert, you are our guest. We are your host. So where can people learn a little bit more about Professor Robert E. G. Black? Um, oh, they don't want to do that. You can <laughs> search. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> and so we'll move on. <laughs> no, you can, you can actually search Robert E.G. Black on most social media. You'll find me. Or you can look at, I got two podcasts that'll be done by the time this episode goes up. Dave Made a Minute, where we looked at the indie film Dave Made a Maze, and I gave minutes randomly to people without them knowing what movie it was. Alan and Walt participated. Did several episodes. But Walt did five, Alan did seven. So, um, well, and then technically and, I was in a couple of others that you just spliced together a bunch of voices from previous minutes. Well, true. 
I think all of the participants were in episode 72 because that was the way it was edited. Which was pretty, and it was an interesting episode to hear how Mm -hmm. you intentionally started to multi-layer to where it was hard to hear almost anybody sort of mirroring the the chaos happening in the movie. And then I did uh, Michael Myers Minute looking at the original Halloween, and by the time this goes up, I hope the pilot at least is up for the room minute, because I'm trying to get that up for Valentine's Day. Well, we've passed Valentine's Day by now, so hopefully you're not breaking any hearts right now. Yeah. Walt, where can people... So what what attracted you to do The Room, by the way? Uh, I was just talking. I'll just sit here. <laughs> and just ignore it. Don't worry about me. I'm just sitting over here. I love horrible movies. Yeah, well, then you picked a good one. I, I watch, like, Oscar-nominated movies and horrible movies sometimes in the same night. Because <laughs> I'm weird. <laughs> well, then that was a good choice. Well, then you fit right in. Yeah, you fit in great here. <laughs> all right well where where can people learn a little more about us well there are two places that we would really appreciate you taking a look the first one is patreon.com slash the wilder ride and that not only gives you some bonus content it also gives you some places that you can help our podcast out um, we do have some expenses that come along with this we've got some uh, expenses that we are planning on for uh, later this year so if um you have a couple of extra dollars laying around and uh, want to throw them our way, that would be awesome. It would really help us out. And again, that's patreon.com slash the wilder ride. And with uh, gifts of $10 a month or more, you're going to get some bonus stuff. The second thing you can do that would be really helpful to us is to go to iTunes, find us there if you're not already subscribed, and write a quick review. And if you like what you're hearing, please give us a five star rating. Uh, With that review that you write, that will help other people find us and push us up the charts a little bit so that people who are searching for Gene Wilder or Blazing Saddles or other things will be able to find our podcast. And of course, I will throw in there for our guest, any of the podcasts you listen to, we all would appreciate if you would take a second, whatever your podcatcher of choice, go in there and just take a second to write a quick review and and, and a four or five star rating. We prefer five, but you know, whatever you think we're, we're, we're bringing to you. But that comment really will help all of us here in the podcasting world. All right. We'll come back tomorrow, Thursday, for minute number nine, where we are going to see Bart and Charlie lying there. We're going to start the minute with, well, boys, the break is over. And we move to someone saying, so the railroad's got to go through Rock Ridge. And that's the first time we actually, uh, separate from the script, the first time we hear about the town of Rock Ridge. But you're going to have to come back tomorrow for a Thursday episode of The Wilder Ride, where we'll start with, well, boys, the break is over. And we're going to end with, so the railroad's got to go through Rock Ridge. And to find out what Rock Ridge is all about and who's saying what to whom, you'll have to just join us again right here on this The Wilder Ride. Wild, get your rope. <laughs> I got nothing. I just fucked up the whole end. <laughs> you really did, man. That's a disaster. <laughs> I just... <laughs> I'm just I'm gonna hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull a chari. Only this time I'm going all the way under the quicksand. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, Robert may be willing to hold you under. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff tastes like. Ass. But you're going to have to come back tomorrow for a Thursday edition. No, I fucked that up, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> no, I did that right, because it is the last episode. Oh, damn it. I got to do that intro again, or outro. I'm sorry. <laughs> nice Let's job. try that again. <laughs> you're going to have to come back for a Thursday. You- oh, God damn it. I'm going to... All right. <clears throat> <laughs>